Wednesday, I guess it was, or maybe yesterday, I gave a little quick introduction to this whole problem of remote sensing and really atmospheric correction. And that was all done so that when Jeremy Wardell gets here next week, he's going to walk in the door and say, starting with the level 1B, top of the atmosphere radiances, we do the following. 27 steps later, you then finally have a remote sensing reflectance at the sea surface. So he asked me to sort of set him up for that. And then Ken, of course, talked a little bit about how you do the, uh, um, the uh, vicarious calibration. Well, today uh, we're going to get into a little bit of detail on two different general classification schemes for how you actually take one of these water leaving, I mean, uh, remote sensing reflectance spectra and retrieve something you're interested in from it, like chlorophyll concentration or uh, bottom depth or backscatter coefficient or whatever it happens to be. And I'm going to talk about a general scheme of algorithms called statistical or empirical methods, and then Colin's lecture this morning will be about another big classification of algorithms called semi-empirical uh, methods. So anyway, this is sort of how the whole game got started, and we'll just walk through some history and then look at two of these different methods. But kind of keep in mind what we're doing here is an inverse problem. We're going to have incomplete light measurements, so maybe only the remote sensing reflectance spectrum. And it's going to have errors in it because of bad atmospheric connection, uh, correction. Or, you know, it might be optically shallow water, but you don't know how deep it is. So there's all kinds of imperfect information there. But we're going to have a very simple little math model of some sort that we're going to take what we do know. We maybe add some constraints, and some way we'll come out with what we're interested in, like IOPs or chlorophyll concentration. And so this general classification of statistical or empirical methods really just amounts to being correlations between the what you have, remote sensing reflectance, and what you want, like chlorophyll. Um, so the way you get these models is you have a, <coughs> a big data set that has both the inputs and the outputs. So you have a data set of remote sensing reflectances and at the same time you measured those, you measured the chlorophyll in the water. And then one way or another, you can then find a, a correlation function of some sort that will say, given the remote sensing reflectances, here's the chlorophyll. And so these techniques are really nothing but fancy curve fitting uh, to get you know input versus output, plot all the points, fit a curve through them, and that's your statistical model. And uh, that's how this whole business got started way back in the days of CZCS. And you get some really useful and pretty pictures like this, but with some very simple ways to do it. And I'm going to look at two examples of statistical methods, one of them band ratio algorithms, and that goes all the way back to the first days of CZCS. That's how we justified building the satellite to begin with. And then a more recent and somewhat fancier technique called neural networks. But they're both uh, really just fancy curve fitting. So Ken showed you this curve the other day. Here's some measured, um, in this case, this is LW, water leaving radiance, but measured spectra as a function of chlorophyll. And people looked at this, and as Ken said, they said, well, gee, if we measured the blue wavelength here, there's a lot of variability depending on chlorophyll. There's not much variability back in the green. So if we took a ratio of, say, blue to green, then we might be able to correlate that with the chlorophyll concentration, and away we'll go. So here's the curve that actually started it all. There's 33 data points here where, and I should back up here, uh, CZCS called these bands 1, 2, 3, and 4. So band 1 is nominally 443, band 2 at 520, 3 at 550, and 4 at 670. So those were the four bands in the visible. So they said, well, look, if we look at the ratio of, say, band 1 to band 3, that is 443 to 550, we'll see some kind of correlation with chlorophyll. 
So here's a plot here of the log of the ratio of band 1 to band 3, so 443 to 550, and here's the log of the chlorophyll measured at the same time. Very nice little relation, and this is for case 1 water. There's only 33 data points here. You fit a straight line through it on the log-log scale, so you look at this and say, well, I've got basically y, which is log of chlorophyll, is some constant times another constant times x, which is the log of 443 to 550. And then just a straight best fit here gives me C1 and C2. So now I've got a simple little formula where if I come along and I make my measurement and I take the radiance at 443 to 550, plug in my formula, I'll get a chlorophyll value. So come up here, across, boom, it's over. And a formula that simple, or, or data this simple, was really the basis of justifying the CZCS satellite in saying, look, we really can do this. So it's amazing, with only 33 data points, they started the whole process of ocean uh, color remote sensing. And little simple formulas like that are what give you, in the days of CCCS, this kind of image, which completely blew everybody away. Uh, you know, there's a saying now, the ocean is inhomogeneous at all scales. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at kilometer scales or centimeter scales. There's, you know, just amazing heterogeneity in the oceans here. And people really didn't expect this sort of thing because, yeah, Jason. Why did they use LWs rather Well, uh, that's just the way these data. Uh, here, the airplane was, this is actually airborne data. They were flying over and they were measuring LU. And uh, I don't know, this might even have been an LU measurement, but maybe they did some little bit of atmospheric correction. I'm not sure. But basically, they had a radiance measurement, so that's what they plotted. And then very quickly, people realized, you know, we need to use reflectances, not the radiances themselves. And, uh, but this particular plot here and this particular formula actually was in terms of radiance. And of course, this, this ratio is not too far off from an RRS ratio because you're going to divide each one of these by the ED. And so anyway, that's just for a historical paper from 40 years ago, that's what they happen to use. Nowadays, we use reflectances. Ken? Are they? OK, so yeah, somewhere along the way, they, they switched over and keep doing things better. But yeah, I guess you're, you're right. I don't remember. Uh, anyway, CZCS, which was only a proof of principle satellite, we're just going to go up, see if it works. It actually worked for uh, many, many years and generated 66,000 images like this. And we're all here today because of simple little formulas like that. Now, if you go to the recent literature, um, there's much fancier things. So here, uh, the CWIFS OC4 version 4 algorithm for chlorophyll, well, what they've done is they plotted chlorophyll versus ratios of, in this case now, remote sensing reflectances. But this algorithm, for example, says, look, look at the ratio of 443 to 555, 490 to 555, and 510 to 555. Look at those three ratios, pick the biggest one, the maximum, take the log of that, and that's this x, and then we take x and we plug it into this little fourth order formula here, and that'll give us chlorophyll in milligrams per cubic meter. Now, all they've done here is taken the chlorophyll versus these different ratios, and it's not a straight line, it's got some curvature to it. So they fit a fourth order polynomial, which is the black line here. And then you come along and you pick the biggest of these ratios, you come up to the black line, you come across, and that's your chlorophyll value. Yeah? I'm not expecting that really to pull it outside of that dynamic range, though, right? To pull it outside I'm of. I'm not expecting that, that relationship to hold outside of that dynamic range, right? They would right. I mean, this. Well, you know, put it this way. There's a few thousand data points there. This is the best curve. And, of course, 
it, it's, uh, I, know, I think this is, you know, for case one water. And then, of course, the catch is if you look at any given value of the ratio, so I come up right here, well, the formula says chlorophyll is 0.1234, but it could have been 0.2, it could have been 0.8. You know, there's kind of like factor of two variability here that's just inherent in the data. You know, even though all of these points have the same chlorophyll, these are small phytoplankton, these are big ones, these are light limited, these are nutrient limited. So there's this inherent variability here that says in a, in a little statistical formula like this, you're just never going to do better than maybe 30% at best or more than likely 50%. And so you've got some pretty big errors uh, or, or error bars on any retrieval from a formula like this. And of course, people sort of sometimes forget that there's error bars there and they say, oh, here's my band ratio and the chlorophyll is 6.023. Well, yeah, 6.023 plus or minus one. Uh, so, you know, that, that sort of seems to be forgotten. But that's there. It's in use operationally. You know, it's, it's certainly useful. You just kind of have to keep in mind that it's based on a bunch of data sets from different water bodies, and, you know, it may or may not give a right answer. Uh, here's a similar formula. Uh, Modus's formula for how do you get KD at 490. Well, it's 488 over 551 plugged into a little formula here. Here's Modus's uh, formula for ACDOM, the absorption by CDOM at 4, 400, and for the absorption by phytoplankton at 675. It says compute these three ratios, 412 to 551, 43, 488. You get these three numbers. To get CDOM, you take those three numbers and you plug them into this little formula which is just a fit to some data. Or for the phytoplankton, you plug in these different ratios and they're squared and you know whatever. It's just a fit to some data. So there's nothing more in any of these statistical methods than taking some data and getting a best fit curve to it. And then in practice, forgetting about the size of the errors. Yeah, Colin. Yeah, okay, so now that you have Hydrolyte, here's a fun little project. Um, run Hydrolyte, generate a bunch of RRS spectra. And so you'll pick, let's say, the new case one model, you put in chlorophyll of 2.5, generate the spectrum. Then take these band ratios, plug them into the CZCS chlorophyll uh, 
formula. Plug them into the Modus chlorophyll formula for case one water. Uh, plug them into the CWIS chlorophyll formula and see how much different these different estimates of chlorophyll will be for the exact spectrum. And then, you know, go back to, well, what was the chlorophyll I used in hydrolyte? It can be pretty scary to see what a wide range of numbers you get. Uh, anyway, there, there's a paper in your in your folder there by Derricky and Stramsky where they, they have all these different formulas and they've compared them all, um, but you can do the same comparison with hydrolyte. Okay, one of the bad things about these band ratio algorithms is they're throwing away the magnitude of the, of the uh, spectrum here. So you're taking a ratio and that's, in a sense, you're looking at the shape of the curve, but you're sort of throwing away the magnitude of the curve. And so you're losing information there. We'll get to techniques later called spectrum matching, where you're not just looking at the shape of the curve when you take the ratio of two wavelengths. You're actually going to use the magnitude information as well. But these have a sort of philosophical disadvantage that by taking a ratio of different wavelengths, you're you're losing whatever information is contained in the magnitude of the spectrum. On the other hand, that also has its good points because <clears throat> if you have bad atmospheric correction, your curve's a little too high or a little too low, so the magnitude can be off, but if you're looking at just the ratio of two different wavelengths, that won't change too much. So here's just an example of uh, remote sensing reflectance versus wavelength for two different atmospheric correction schemes that we'll say a little bit about later, but it's the same image, same people working on it. They use two different atmospheric correction schemes, one called ELF and one called TOFCA, and they get two much different spectra here. Well, these are sort of like, you know, 50% difference in magnitude, but they have kind of the same shape. So if I take the ratio of, say, this wavelength to this one, for the purple curve, and maybe that ratio is 0.2, and I take the ratio of this wavelength to this one for the white curve, that's going to be roughly the same. So in the early days of remote sensing, when the atmospheric correction techniques were not very good, it was actually a virtue to have an algorithm that was not too sensitive to bad atmospheric correction. Now we can do atmospheric correction better, so it's we could bring these two curves together with some luck, and then we can say, let's not just look at the shape of the curve with the band ratio. We can now use also the magnitude information that's in the curve. So, you know, some one side it's a good thing, one side it's a bad thing when you use band ratio algorithms. But one thing they all have a problem with is non-uniqueness. If we're looking at just the ratio of two different wavelengths, here's a hundred and something spectra. And if I look at five, 500 to 555, all of these spectra, which are obviously completely different spectra, they all have exactly the same band ratio value. So in this case, RRS at 490 to 555 is 1.71 plus or minus 0.01 for each of these spectra. And so if you take this and plug it into uh, the CWIF's OC2 algorithm, it'll tell you the chlorophyll was 0.59. Well, actually, all of these spectra had a chlorophyll of less than 0.02. And the reason these spectra are different is that it was clear, shallow water, and there's bottom reflectance effects. So normally, you, wouldn't re you would never apply this CWIF's algorithm here anyway. You would have said, oh, this is shallow water. The algorithm can't be applied there, and you wouldn't do it. But I just want to make the point that you can have much different spectra that have the same band ratio value, but if you were looking at some technique that used the magnitude of the spectrum, then you would see these as all being very different instead of all being the same. So that's this non-uniqueness problem where there's clearly something much different about what's going on in nature to generate these, big, these different spectra. You just can't figure out what that is from a simple band ratio. And 
here's an example of that. So Heidi Dearson, who unfortunately couldn't come and give us an invited talk next week, but during this field experiment that the back row here and I were all on, uh, Dearson did, here's 3,600 measurements where she measured the bottom depth in very shallow water in the Bahamas, so down to about six meters. She measured bottom depth and she had the radiometer, so she measured the hyperspectral remote sensing reflectance. And she found out that if I plot the remote sensing at 555 to 670 versus the depth, I get this pretty nice cloud of points here, well behaved, and then she fit a nice little curve through it that you see in gray here. And that simply says take the log of the two RRS at the two wavelengths, and then here's a best fit quadratic curve then you plug in your x value here and you get out the bottom depth. So take the ratio up to the curve, here's the depth, four and a half meters. Works pretty darn well for her data set. Then of course I come along and she publishes this and I say, wow, I'll try this on my image. So here's an image now, this is from an airborne hyperspectral sensor. Uh, here's a sandbar here. Uh, this is uh, deeper water here, it's down around 8 or 10 meters, and it's dark because it has a seagrass bottom. And then the red here, this is a sort of false color image. This is actually an island here and a little bit of an island there. And I can tell you from experience that this point right here is this deep because I was standing there snorkeling and I could just get my head above the water. So I know this is just about 2 meters deep right here and then out here, this is about uh, 8 to 10 meters. So I take my image, and at each pixel here, I have the remote sensing reflectance spectrum, and it's been atmospherically corrected and all of that. So I pull the spectrum out. I plug it into the Dearson algorithm, and it says, OK, over the sandbar here, here the depth is, it says, 2 to 4 meters. So it's actually you know, more at the 2 side going down to 4 then four to six, and then out here, it's all less than two meters deep, which is completely wrong, okay? Then I tried another algorithm, same image, same spectra, and its retrieval says, okay, two to four meters deep, and oh look, you can actually see the little bright yellow spot right here where Kurt was standing, where it was actually two meters, and then it goes deeper and deeper, and then out here, it says six to eight meters, and finally the deepest little points out here are at 8 to 10 meters. And that's a pretty good retrieval. Well, why did the Dearson algorithm fail? So I, uh, or it failed over the deeper, darker bottoms. It did OK over the shallow, brighter bottoms. OK, so if I do some hydrolyte runs here, and I plot this ratio versus bottom depth down to 10 meters deep for two different sets of IOPs and two different bottom types, sand and seagrass. So a bright bottom and a dark bottom. And then I don't remember the details, but I took some you know, AC9 data from the area. And I took a couple of those and, and ran hydrolyte uh, four different times. <clears throat> so here, for example, the red curve is my IOP set one with a sand bottom. And the yellow curve is my IOP set one with a grass bottom, so it's, it's darker. Well, anyway, and then the black curve is Dearson's formula. So if I take, for example, a ratio of 25 for RRS to 670, and I come up here, and I hit, let's say I'm on the bright sand, uh, or uh, let's say the, yeah, any one of these. But So I hit the red curve here, and it would say the bottom no, actually, sorry. Let's look at the let's look at the yellow curve. So that's one set of IOPs in the dark grass bottom. So I come up, I hit the yellow curve, and it says the depth is four meters. Or I come up to here, the yellow curve curves back around. It could also be nine meters deep. So for this band ratio and this particular set of IOPs and this particular bottom type. I could either retrieve 4 meters or 9 meters depth. It's ambiguous. So that's non-uniqueness. Now, F Dearson's formula uh, in this particular case would say it was uh, 2, 3, 5 meters or something. But the point is, 
that you can get non-uniqueness here. And so what happened when I applied her formula here over the bright sand bottom, I happened to be hitting a curve like the red one here, so IOP sand one, and it came up and it said, oh, okay, I only see one solution, and here it is, bottom types three meters deep, whatever the number was. But for that darker bottom, notice it's the, the darker, the grass bottoms here are the ones that curve over at sort of the shallowest depths. Then her algorithm happened to come along and it gave me a solution like two meters deep when there was a second solution that maybe should have been eight meters deep. So it's non-uniqueness. Now Heidi would come along and say, well remember, my database here only went down to six meters. So you can't expect my curve to work for eight or 10 meters of water. So you shouldn't be using it anyway. Perfectly correct. On the shallower bottoms where it was bright sand, I'm sort of in this region of her curve here, and it worked okay. So I pushed her formula beyond its region of validity. It ended up then being non-unique and giving me a completely wrong retrieval. Doesn't mean her formula is wrong, it just means I'm applying it to deeper bottoms than is in her database and I can't expect it to work and lo and behold it didn't, but other techniques can work and we'll see those in my last lecture. Kurt, this is where validation is so important because you don't know a priori when you get a more sensitive image the depth of water, that's part of what you're trying to get. Yeah. Assuming that the depth is less than, uh, than, than seven meters, this is the solution. But you don't know if it is or not because you're not there. And that's where it's always very useful to have, in those cases, some, something that tells you what, yeah. what's it's likely to be. And if we look a little further here in these simulations that I did, um, here is, in the green, is the bottom reflectance for uh, some sort of green seagrass and that scale over here. So you can see the seagrass reflectance is about four to eight percent depending on the wavelength and it peaks in the green because green grass is green. So there's the bottom reflectance. Now I plug this into hydrolyte, pick some IOPs, etc. And if I put the bottom at four meters, then here's my remote sensing reflectance out here and I get the red curve. If I put the bottom at nine meters, here's the curve that hydrolyte gets. And both of the red and the blue curves, if I look at this 555 to 670 ratio, they both have the same value. It's about 25 plus or minus 0.1. And when I take that 25 and I plug it back into Dearson's formula, 25 to her formula, and it comes back and says the depth is one, two, three, 4.8 meters. So that's how her formula works. But I can't really tell the difference in the bottom at four meters and the bottom at nine meters. So that's why her her thing has problems is that you have this non-uniqueness. And in remote sensing inverse problems you always have to worry about non-uniqueness. Okay so to kind of move on in some cases you can plot up your data and look at it and say, oh, you know, I'll fit this with a cubic function or a quadratic or a linear function or whatever. So you can look at your data and get some idea of what the mathematical model that fits that data is going to look like. And then you fit your curve, you get your coefficients, and you publish your new um, statistical model. But in some cases, the data may be such a mess and so complicated and there's so many variables you can't just plot it up like this look at it and say let's try a cubic function so what do you do then well there are ways here to let the data sort of define the model itself and that leads us into neural networks so the idea is with neural networks we're going to have a whole bunch of very simple little processing elements. And these little elements, they'll just do something like, say, 
take some numbers and add them together and send out another number. And so very simple. But all of these little processing elements are going to be connected with each other. And then they're going to have very simple inputs and very simple outputs. And the most important thing is as we train the neural network, and we'll see how this happens, that these elements can kind of learn on their own which inputs are important and which are not. And this guy over here gives me good information, and this guy over here, his information's kind of useless. So it's what's called adaptive interaction, or you can train the neural network and let it sort of figure out how to take the inputs and give you the output that you want. And neural networks are useful when we don't know the mathematical form of the model that links our input and output. We can't just make a simple plot and say cubic function. It's useful when we have a lot of examples of the behavior we require. That is, in, in our case, we have a lot of data where we measure remote sensing reflectance and chlorophyll. And we can use that data to train the neural network. And um, we want to let the model or the data itself determine the structure of the model. So we're going to use the data we have, and some way this technique is going to give us the model. All right, so here's the basic idea for neural networks is uh, you have in, in, the, in your brain, you have these uh, cells here, your nerve cells in your brain. And so one of these guys will have all these little arms sticking out of it, then they kind of go off to the neighboring cells. But what one nerve cell does is it says, I'm receiving some input from my neighbors. And all it says, in, the, in your brain, these are electrical inputs. So here comes this cell up here has fired. It sends an electrical pulse down the road. This one fired. These two didn't. So this cell right here says, look, I've received these two inputs. And now all I have to do is decide, do I fire or not fire? If I fire, I send an electrical input down the road, and all of the, the cells that I'm connected to will detect that input. And then all this cell has to do is say, oh, I've received some inputs from all these other cells. Do I want to fire and send on an input? or not. So it's a very simple processing uh, way, but of course in your brain you've got you know trillions and trillions of connections between like a hundred billion cells. So there's a lot of, of uh, generality there. And so here's how a very simple neural network would work. Here's our nerve cell and some neighboring nerve cells are over here. And they're going to give some input here, let's say x1 and x2. But in general, this might be remote sensing reflectance at 443 and remote sensing reflectance at 555 in our case. So there's what's called an input layer, which has the inputs coming in to your neuron or your processing unit. So these are the inputs. And then there's what are called hidden layers, which are the little processors. And all the little processor does is say, I'm going to take the input here. I'm going to weight it by some function. I'm going to take the input here, weight it by some, some value. I'll add those two inputs together. I might add a bias. And I'll compare that with a threshold. And if I'm less than the threshold, I don't do anything. If I'm greater than the threshold or greater than an equal, I'll output a 1. So it says, OK, this times this plus this times this plus some bias is, let's say, bigger than some number. Then I'll send a 1 down the road. And that 1 is now going to be one of the inputs to the next cell down the road. OK, so that's the, the scheme for a uh, the, sort of the simplest neural network you could think of. Now, uh, in practice, or are the, are the essence of a neural network is that it's going to learn from the data. And we're going to have to some way figure out what these weights are so that for the given inputs, like RRS 443 and 555, 
I'm going to have to figure out what the weights are so that this thing will output the right chlorophyll concentration. That's what we're after in oceanography. So uh, that process is called training the neural network. And there's a couple of ways you can do that, one of which is called backpropagation of errors. So I want to just show you a little Java applet here, and we'll walk through this. It's actually kind of slick. So here we go. Here's our little simple neural network we just looked at. It's going to take an input times a weight, input times a weight, sum those together, compare them with a threshold, and then put out a value. And I hope, let's see, uh, I hope you guys can see that. It's not all cut off at the bottom here. Uh, let's see. Let me make sure I can move this up. And then, okay, this is what we need to see. And let me move that to the top. Okay, so we've got some data with our known, with our inputs and our, our outputs. So here's our training data set. I've got four sets of values, and I want to train this neural network so that if both of the inputs are zero, it gives me zero output. And if either the first or the second input or both of them are one, I want my neural network to output one. So here's my data set where I have known inputs and the desired outputs. Now I have to some way figure out the weights in the neural network so that I can reproduce this data set. So what you do is say, let's start out with some guesses for the initial weights. So here's 0.1 and 0.3. So let me just draw that up here since it's gone off the top of the page. So I've got x1 and x2 are coming in, and those are going to be either 0 or 1. I'm going to multiply this by weight 1 and weight 2, and then I'm going to sum them together, x1, w1, plus x2, w2, and then I'm going to see is that greater than or less than some threshold here, and then I'm going to output either a 0 or a 1. So that's all I'm going to do. I know my inputs. I know my outputs. I do not know the weights, and determining the weights is what I do when I train the network. Okay, so the way it works is I take my data, I make a couple of initial guesses at the weights, and these can be anything, so 0.1 and 0.3 is what's here, and I say, okay, now, will these weights give me the right output for my data? So. I have an input of 0 times the weight of 0.1 is 0, input of 0 times the weight is 0. I sum those together and I say, is that greater than 0.5? So my threshold here is 0.5. The answer is no, it's not. So I'm going to output a value of 0 because I'm not greater than the threshold. The output I wanted to get was 0. If either one of these is 0, I want 0. So my neural network has correctly predicted the first value. There's no error. I'm happy with these weights. Now let's go to the next iteration. And I'm going to take the, uh, the second input here, where x is 0 and x2, or x1 is 0 and x2 is 1. Do the thing. 0 times the weight is 0. 1 times the weight is 0.3. Add those together. 0.3. Is that less than my threshold? Uh, yeah, so it's less. I'm going to put out a 0. But I wanted a 1. So I've got an error of the desired output minus what the neural network gave me is 1 minus 0 is 0. So the weights are not doing the job. Now the slick thing is here's what happens. You also define what's called a learning rate. In this case, the learning rate was 0.2. And then what you do is you take the error times the learning rate and you add that to any weight that had a non-zero input. So you say, okay, I had an error of 1, 
times 0.2, I'm going to add that to this weight here, which had a non-zero input, and it gives me the new weight of 0.3 plus 0.2 is 0.5. This weight didn't have any input, so it didn't matter what the number was. It didn't affect the answer. So I'm not going to change that. So now I'm going to have a new set of weights, 0.1 and 0.5. Let's now try the third input here. So I'll do the next iteration of... Uh, Next iteration, whoops, wrong button. Uh, yeah, okay. So now I'm on iteration three. I'm going to take my third piece of data. The inputs is one and zero. So I take one times point 0.1, okay, that's one. I take the new input is zero times the new weight. Well, that's a zero. Sum those, it's less than the threshold. I don't put out anything. I put out a zero. In this case, I wanted the answer to be 1, but I predicted a 0. So I have an error of 1 times the learning rate. Add that to all the weights that have non-zero inputs. In this case, there's only 1. So I take 0.2 plus 0.1 gives me the new weight of 0.3. OK, whatever. So let's now go to the fourth iteration. And I say, now let's look at the last piece of data here. I have 1 times my latest weight was 0.3, 1 times 0.5, the sum was 0.8, that's greater than the threshold, output a 1, I wanted a 1, I got no error, I'm happy with these weights. But now let's go through the data set or the training set again. So let's go to the next iteration. And so we're back to input number 1, I want to input two zeros. Multiply by the weights, sum them, zero, less than a half. I predict a zero. I wanted a zero. There's no error. Leave things alone. Go to the next iteration. I'm going to look at the second piece of data again. Now I have zero times 0 0.3 plus one times 0 0.5. Sum them, it's 0 0.5. I'm only going to output a one if it's greater than the threshold. In this case, it happens to be equal. So I output a zero. I wanted the, the right answer was one. So I have an error of one. Take the error times the learning rate, add it to each weight that had a non-zero input. So I'm going to add 0.2 to the 0.5. Gives me a new weight of 0.7. OK. Go to the next iteration. And now I'm going to look at the fourth piece of data. Uh, let's see, did I? Uh, no, sorry, it's the third piece of data. So now I'm going to have a 1 coming in and a 0 coming in. 1 times 0 0.3 times 0 times 0 0.7, 0 0.3. I output a 0. I wanted a 1. I have an error times the learning rate. Correction is 0.2. Add that to all the ones that have non-zero input. So 0.3 plus 0 0.2 is 0 0.5. I leave this one alone because it had 0 input. All right, let's try again the next piece of data. So the eighth iteration. I have ones going in. I want a one coming out. So I have 0.5, 1 times 0.7. It's 1.2. It's greater than the threshold. I output a one. I wanted a one. There's no error. So I'm not going to change anything. Let's go back and go through the data again. All right, next iteration. I'm back to my first data set. I input zeros. They're multiplied times the weight. I get zero. It's less than the threshold. I predict a zero. No error. Leave things alone. Go to the next iteration or the section data set. Now I have zero and one. So the one times 0.7 is 0 0.7. It's greater than the threshold. I output a one. No error. Leave things alone. Try the next data set. Number three, I have 1 and 0 coming in. I end up with 1 times 0.5. Sum that, it's not greater than the threshold, so I output a 0. I have an error there. Error times learning rate adds into the weight that has the non-zero value. So 0.5 plus 0.2 is 0.7. OK, now we have some new weights. Let's do the next iteration. Look at the last value. It's ones going in. 
0 0.7, 0 0.7, 1 1.4, it's greater than the threshold, output of 1, no error, leave things alone. Let's go through the data set again, back to here. All right, we're back to here. So zeros times 0 0.7 is 0. I output a 0, life is good. Go to the next piece of data. Zeros going in, 1 times points, 1's going in here. 1 times the 0.7 is 0 0.7. It's greater uh, than the threshold. I output a 1. I wanted a 1. There's no error. Life is good. Go to the next data set. 1 goes in times 0 0.7. 0 times 0 0.7. The sum is greater than 0 0.5. Output a 1. I wanted a 1. No error. Leave things alone. Go to the last one. Ones are going in times the weights. Sum is greater than the threshold. Output of one, no error. I just went through the whole data set and reproduced every answer that I wanted to get by having adjusted these weights. And so now, if I cycle through the data set, I just keep getting the right answer. And I never change the weights again. So what I've done by cycling through the data set many, many times and using this little trick of a learning rate and correcting the values, the, the previous values of the weights, I finally ended up with a set of weights that reproduces the output that I want to get. And that's the process of training the neural network. And so the knowledge, if you wish, of the neural network is contained in the weights. Now, these weights are not unique. If I picked 0.6 and 0.8 here and went through this, I'd have, you know, 1 times 0 0.6, uh, 0 times 0 0.8, oh, I'd have 0.6, but that's greater than 5, and so I'm still getting the right answer. So you can't, you can't attach any physical meaning to these weights. They're simply a bunch of fitting coefficients that will give you the right answer. So you can't some way come along and say, oh, you know, RRS at 443 is weighted by this number and RRS at 555 is weighted by some other number and therefore remote sensing reflectance at 443 is telling me something about chlorophyll and 555 is doing whatever. You just can't do that. They're just a bunch of best fit numbers in a really messy model but they have the virtue that they give you the right answer. So let's uh, go back now to the PowerPoint and do this for a little fancier simulation. Whoops. Hang on. Uh, get up there. Okay. So we've now seen a very simple example of how you train a neural network. And what I just showed you was this back propagation of errors. You go through, you get an error, you multiply that times the learning rate, which you know is just a number you guess, and then you propagate that back and you alter the weights. Another way you could, yeah? How do you set the learning rate? Black magic. Um, you just basically, in this case, they just use 0.2. If I had used 0.4, I would have made a bigger change to the weights in each case, but you know, maybe it would have converged faster or maybe slower. Maybe I'm then overcorrecting, and so I have to do things. And so, you know, there's a whole community of people who do neural network stuff who have all their little ways of picking the initial guesses for the weights and the learning rates that are optimum for some kind of problem, but maybe not for another one. So yeah, there's no simple way. And in this little applet, they just picked 0.2, and they picked 0.1 and 0.3 for the initial weights. But you could pick other values, and you might end up with a different set of final weights, but you'll still be able to reproduce the, the answer that you want to get. So, yeah, I'm not a neural network person, and I don't know what the latest on this is, but, you know, there's, there's a whole community of people out there doing that. Another way that you can do this is, let me just back up to look at the, at the equation. You could say, really, what I have here is a model that says, 
x1 w1 plus x2 w2 b plus this has to equal something. And just think of that as a big best fitting curve. Now, in this case, it's really simple. So you could sort of say, you know, fit, fit this data and we'll come up with the weights w1 and w2. In general, in a moment, we're going to have maybe hundreds of weights in our model. And then you use some kind of nonlinear least squares fitting, like uh, Levenberg Marquardt, for example. And you view this as a big, enormous nonlinear least squares fitting problem, where you're fitting your inputs to your data and coming up with a set of weights that give you the best fit. So that's another way to do it. And People for, you know, long ago looked at neural networks and said, well, yeah, the idea is nice, but there's no way to determine these weights. And so it's not a useful technique. Then somebody figured out this back propagation of errors technique, and all of a sudden, hey, this works. We can just sit here and go through our data set again and again and again and finally settle in on a set of weights that works. And then we got computers that were big enough that you could do these enormous nonlinear uh, minimizations, and that was another way to determine the weights. And so then this became a useful technique in the last couple of decades. But yeah, is this like specific, like what? Yeah, I mean your your neural network is going to be determined by whatever data you trained it on. So if Yeah, so I'll talk about the training validation thing here in just a second. Anyway, keep in mind that neural networks are really just fancy regression models whose coefficients or the weights are determined by some kind of fancy t curve fitting, some multidimensional thing. And that's not a criticism. They can work really well. I have nothing against curve fitting if it gives me the right answer. Okay, so here's an example from our very own Wayne Slade, who was one of Emmanuel's students and took this class, you know, four years ago, or six years, whatever it was. Well, he has a nice paper on an actual application of neural networks to chlorophyll retrievals here in the Gulf of Maine. So here's what he did. For, he had 1,100 sets of corresponding remote sensing reflectance spectra and chlorophyll values which he pulled out of these NASA data sets that you're going to learn about next week, CBAM, CBAS, Symbios. So he went through the data set, he pulled out all these spectra and their associated chlorophyll. Then he constructed a neural network that had five inputs, which were remote sensing reflectance at five different wavelengths, and he had two hidden layers. I'll show you the picture in a minute. Each one of those had six neurons, and he eventually gets one output, which is the chlorophyll value. Now, what he did was he took his 1,100 data, or 1,100 spectra, and he partitioned it into 600 that he used for training the neural network, 221 for what's called validation, and 221 for testing the final neural network. And I'll show you this in a second. Okay, and then when the neural network predicts chlorophyll, he compares that with the corresponding chlorophyll predictions from the CWIFS OC4 version 4 algorithm. All right, so here's his neural network. The input layer is RRS at five different wavelengths. Then he had two different hidden layers. I'll call them N and M, you know, six in each thing here. And eventually we're going to get one output, which is the chlorophyll. Now, the way these things are work is that any input in the input layer here has a weight that connects it to every neuron in the first hidden layer here. So this guy is connected to all six of these and on down to this one is connected to all six. So there's five times six is 30 weights here. Then each one of these is connected to all the neurons in the next layer. So there's six times six is 36 weights that connect this layer to this one. And then finally, these guys are outputting six numbers, which get summed up and called the chlorophyll value. Now, why did he pick 
two layers of six instead of one layer of 12? Or why not, uh, if the six and six is 12, why not four layers of three or three layers of four? Well, that's the black art of neural network design. And what you want to do here is, and I don't know what kind of the latest thinking is on the best way to do it, but basically by picking these two layers here, he's got a lot of communications. There's a lot of weights here being determined. And if he had picked, say, one layer of six, he would have only had 30 weights going in, so five times six, and these would have all been added together. So he, he would have only have had 30 weights. And, you know, if he had picked like three layers of four, it would be the same number of 12 processors, but there would have been a different number of weights there. And, you know, I don't know, uh, you'll have to ask a neural network person, if you were given this problem, how would you design your neural network? Would you pick two rows of six or three rows of four? Or, you know, a row of eight and a row of eight, or I mean, who knows? So I don't know why they picked this particular network, but they did. So, yeah. Wait, I want this answer. Yeah. So that the ends, the ends are equivalent in your previous applet of this is the answer that I want. And so I could have, like I say, I could have picked, you know, three hidden layers with four cells apiece or, or three with six or something, and presumably I'll still get the same chlorophyll. I'll just have a different bunch of weights. That's all it amounts to. Yeah. Those are interconnected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, like I say, I don't know how these guys what kind of rules they have for designing the best neural network for a given problem. Uh, I don't know what the what the rules are on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you could pick, you know, you could pick five inputs here and and three here and outputs the chlorophyll, and you'll probably find that yeah, you'll get a set of weights that does as good as possible, but it won't be very good. If you pick, you know, a thousand weights, all you'll do is fit noise, and uh, that's that's the next topic. So here. What he does is, I've plotted here mean square error between the neural network output and the correct output. And then the training cycle, you know, we went through the same set of data time and time again. Okay, if you just keep cycling through the training data, you'll keep reducing your percentage error. Now, in our little example a while ago, we were able to get perfect output after we went through, you know, a dozen times or so. In the real world, with a neural network like this one, where you may have hundreds of weights, what will happen is if you just keep cycling through the training data, you'll keep getting slightly better and better and better results. But somewhere along the way, here for the first few cycles through, you're really picking out and fitting the physics of the problem. And somewhere along the way, even though you're still getting a better and better answer, you're really just fitting the noise in the data. But you don't know where that happens along the way. So what you want to do is capture the major part of the physics, but you don't want to fit the noise in the data or the errors. So that's why he split his data into a training set and a validation set. So what you do is you take your training data, which in this case was 600 and something sets, and you keep cycling through that, and you keep getting new sets of weights. And then each time you do that, you go back and you take the inputs from your validation set and say, how well did I predict the chlorophyll? Well, as you are training your neural network with the training